Um, so I'm going to jump into some questions before we get to your all questions, just to seed things. Um, so Trey, we mostly know you as a photographer. That's mm. your sort of main thing. Why are you writing a book about staying zen on social media? Right. Well, that is, you know, 90% of the, the business is fine art, and then 10% is sort of social media. So I accidentally became uh, an expert at this. And I've, I've noticed that there is an incredible amount of suffering out there. And I think it's important for, for people that are able to reduce suffering in the world. I think it's, it's good to do that. That's, that's a good thing. And of course, there's, there's many categories of suffering. There's like real suffering, like um, you know, civil wars or hunger, this sort of thing. But I've noticed in the last three or four years, there's a new kind of suffering, this suffering that's brought about by, by social media. Um, so I'll tell you this funny story. I, it's a personal story. Um, I became a full-time artist uh, 12 years ago when I was 35. Before that, I was IT, computer science, very left brain. And so I made this transition to being a full-time artist. And I was talking with this, um, this, this wise old lady. And I was asking her for advice because she was an artist. She goes, Trey, you will encounter a massive amount of suffering. Most of it will be self-imposed. And that's what it is. You People heap suffering on themselves when really it's a fictionalized reality. It's not real suffering. And so when I see people suffering anxiety online, um, now it's been exacerbated and uh, accelerated by the way social media works. Um, you're constantly being reminded that you're not enough. And this feeds off what I feel is um, a problem with humans that you can't overcome, which is a, a, an ego. Right? You tell yourself this story about yourself. And when things don't match up with that story, it causes you a massive amount of anxiety. So I became like uh, an influencer, right? I didn't know what that was. I remember um, like 10 years ago, I was speaking at this travel photography conference. And we had one of these, right afterwards, we had one of these dreadful cocktail parties, right? Where your people are mixing around in this, this nice, well, a meaning lady came up to me, and her eyes were as big as saucers. And she goes, are you an influencer like us? And I was like, what, what the fuck is an influencer? You know, I can't, I can't even influence my kids to clean their room, so I don't think so. Um, but then I started to run into more and more of these people. Some were legit, and some, they didn't quite fit right. You know, I like to have deep conversations. And so I would talk to them, and I noticed sometimes there was a lacking, uh, a hollowness, something that wasn't there that should be there, no substance. And then I started looking into it more and more, and I realized that a lot of these people, because I, I work in the luxury travel industry, um, are faking it. You know, they, they might have uh, bought their followers, uh, bought their likes, bought their comments, and then they approach these big brands, and then they ask for you know, a lot of money and free travel and all this stuff, and then they put these things online that they're having the perfect life. And this, in turn, causes a massive amount of anxiety online. But it's all based on a false narrative. Mm. So they end up spawning a bunch of copycats. And now there is what I consider to be this mass delusional behavior of everyone pretending to have the perfect life. They all know that it doesn't ring true in their heart, so that causes them anxiety. But everyone else that doesn't have a perfect life, which is pretty much everybody, they feel more like losers. They feel like if they only had these things in their life, then they could be whole people. But this entire thing is based on a false narrative that you don't need any of that to be a complete person, that you're already a complete person. So uh, a lot of questions emerge from the, mm -hmm. the narrative you just put forth. Um, one of them is what, and, and again, um, these are deeply philosophical questions, but what compels people to um, feed on this um, sense of lack? Like, right. you know, if it really is, diminishing me and making me feel worse, why can't I put the phone down? Right. Well, that's a good question. Who is the I that is putting the phone down and not putting it down? Um, it go, the more you study uh, mindfulness and consciousness, and you know, I'd recommend books by Eckhart Tolle, like uh, The Power of Now and A New Earth, and Michael Singer's, um, what's that book called? I'll think about it in a minute. Um, Google. Gosh darn it. Yeah, Google it. Can anyone Google that? Um, 
Anyway, so these help to help you to realize that you are not the voice in your head, right? You're the silence behind the voice that can watch the thoughts go by. And you'll notice that whenever a thought goes by or you see something online and it gets stuck and it, it bothers you, you're like, like notice, like, oh, isn't it interesting that's bothering you? Why is that bothering me? Well, as stuff passes by you, it gets stuck on this egoic construct, this framework that you built up in your brain about your life, you know, and the, the groups that you believe in, what you believe in, and when you see something that comes in that doesn't match it, that like makes you angry, right? Or it makes you upset. And what, what's actually happening there is that your ego is just reinforcing itself saying, I have the right story. I find that to be wrong. And it makes, it, it makes the monster even bigger. And as you stay on to look for things that will make it stronger or more defensible, right? This is why you stay online because you have come to identify yourself with the stories that you tell yourself in your head. And social media now is so good at either going against those stories or for those stories. So it only reinforces what you think is yourself, but that's not your true self. Your true self is one without any of these thoughts or preferences. Um, you, know, you can be the dolphin that swims in the waves. And so many, so many people get caught up in, um, in so many things that bother them all day and they continue to complain online. If you notice, I notice this, that a lot of positive, loving people don't even spend time on a, on a Facebook anymore uh, because it just becomes sort of this cesspool of complaining. And if you read comments anywhere, you know, like even, even YouTube, especially Facebook or whatever, you see that there's like this whole new group of, of idiots out there, right? And I consider this to be like the Cambrian explosion of idiot species. We've never seen like, like oh, look, there's a guy that's an anti-vaxxer and a flat earther. That's a new species. And so, <laughs> these, these platforms that we use, they've accidentally reinforced some of these ideas, which may or not be true. Like there are good ideas out there, and groups form around them, and there are bad ideas, and groups form around them. Like examples of good ideas are like the Dallas Cowboys, uh, gardening club, um, you know, board gaming club. Um, these are good ideas, and groups form around them, and people share in positive, loving ways. And then there's bad ideas, and those get spread even quicker. And a lot of the bad ideas form groups where the groups are against the other groups. Like the board gaming group, they don't care about the Dallas Cowboys group. They're not saying, oh man, I hate those Cowboys. The Cowboys are saying like, God, I'm glad we don't play video games. There's like the loving, positive idea groups. And these other ones, which reinforce themselves by destructing other groups. And that's, that's not good. And the ego, you have a choice. Like what, where do you want to be? Do you want to be in a positive, loving place of which there's so many great groups. You can, and the internet can be an incredible thing for spreading that. But a lot of times, you, I think we have this Pareto distribution of, of like 20% good stuff to 80% bad stuff. And there are bad aspects of human nature uh, that are based on fear and a lot of these things that are reinforced by the media, um, which you, know, you don't have to be scared of all this stuff. You can go into a loving place. And so people end up in these groups and then that's why they can't put down their phone because they're seeing things that make them angry or make them really happy when really none of it has to really matter in your life. You can be the silence behind your thoughts. You don't have to be this all-consuming, um, you know, a semblance of groups that define you. So in terms of our personal responsibility and accountability towards remedying this situation, I can think of a few recourses. One is to shun technology altogether, to basically say, this leads to an unhealthy place. I'm going to uh, opt out. Right. Another would be to attenuate it and sort of say, everything in moderation, you know, I'm going to sort of use some of the tools that Google and others are putting forward to monitor and regulate, you know, similar to food. There's right. uh, an RDA for these things, and I'm going to sort of be very disciplined and thoughtful. Another would be to change the way I relate. So you talk a lot about Zen. So as opposed to sort of shunning technology, is there a way to partake of it that is less destructive or less um, you know, negative in, in terms of my own reaction to these things? And then finally, there's sort of unfollow. So I can right. be more thoughtful in terms of what I expose myself to. And I imagine there's a spectrum, as you're saying, there's sort of very destructive groups. And right. then there's others that are sort of healthy. So I can have a responsibility to sort of turn the dial toward the healthy and away from the destructive. Right. Like 
Is it all of the above? Like, what is your approach towards health and right. our relationship to media? Um, you know, as all the parents that are out there know this, you want your kids to end up with the good kids, you know, that are out there playing the good sports, that have, you know, positive habits and that sort of thing, because they will start to feed off of that. Um, you don't want to become part of the bad group. But think the same thing for yourself. Ha have the same desires for yourself that you have for your kids. You want to be part of the good, positive, loving groups. Because, you know, the gr brains are incredibly pl plastic. And the more good, positive, loving stuff you have come into your world, the better. Like, surround yourself with friends that want the best for you. You know, I want the best for you. You want the best for me. Um, this is a sort of a mindset shift. Because all this same stuff is on social media. Now, on the other side of it, I, I grew up with social media being a, a creative, right, being a photographer. And I would hang out with other photographers and creatives online. And so a, a creative, and it doesn't matter. When I say creative, you can do anything from, you know, uh, you know, bake cookies to there's all kinds of creative pursuits out there, right? It doesn't have to be visual arts, be audio, whatever. Like, I found it very natural to make a creation and then share it online. Okay. In the same way that my little girls, they would like make a something on construction paper and put glitter on it, and then they would run around the house and show everybody. Right? There's no ego involved. Like it's just pure creation. And it's said that a creation doesn't exist until you share it with the world. And I think that's true. And so I was with all these other creatives online and we were all sharing. And I would sometimes get negative feedback. Actually, I would often get negative feedback because my photos were quite controversial because I would do things in a different, different way. Not different because I wanted to be different, but just it felt right to me. I was very interested in, in light and the way it, it affected people. And so early on, I developed a very thick skin because I, re I received so much negative feedback. And, and I was wondering about that, you know, because I know a lot of people are scared and you know, if you get negative feedback, it just feeds that healthy self-doubt that we all have. Like, oh, it's, yeah, maybe I'm not so good and all this sort of stuff. And again, that's just your, your ego. Just notice when things bother you and say, like, you know, I, I'm a good person. I'm trying. You know, I may not always be successful, but I'm a good person. So I think if you go into it with that mindset. And the second thing is you can notice the negative comments, but a, a way not to let them get to you is, you know, and this is a little hokey, but stick with me. I, I think about this definitely in creative things. And actually, it is sort of this Zen thing. Like we're all, you know, flowers and we're growing, right? And as you grow, your petals come out, you get whipped around by the wind. You know, it's kind of bothersome. You have, you have rain hitting you. You have all this stuff going on, right? But you, you're okay with it. You just grow. That's what you do. You're a flower. You just keep growing. You notice, you notice the rain and the wind, but you don't, you don't let it get to you. Um, so it's sort of this, have this idea of like, you're a work in progress, I'm a work in progress. Um, don't listen to that negative stuff out there. Um, and you're gonna be just fine. Surround yourself with you know, positive, loving people that want the best for you. Um, and just notice when you're in a cesspool of negativity, you'll notice online that uh, complainers tend to stick together, right? Mm -hmm. Someone says, oh, let, let me tell you about this problem I'm having with so-and-so. And then the next complainer will come aboard and say, like, oh, you think that's a problem? Listen to this problem I'm having. So this is, just an, this is not a good, positive space for the human mind to be. Um, and there's so many great places you can go where you can be supported, where you don't have to spend the whole day. Imagine going the entire day without being bothered by anything. And just like loving things and having awesome people in your life, is it that what we all want? And you, you can slowly make that choice, make little improvements every day to change where you, you spend your time. So it sounds like most of what you're talking about is changing your relationship to the content and being determined in how it affects you. Do you also, like in terms of absolutes, like monitor your own screen time on a daily basis? Do you think that's good, bad, is it a muscle we need to build, or is that sort of a different dimension? Um, I spend most of my time um, creating and very little time consuming what's on social media. Um, I do pay attention to a few close friends. I think it's a good, good idea to uh, unfollow people that aren't bringing positivity into your life, and uh, just people that are inspirational and give you good ideas and help you 
be a better person because I, you know, I get inspired by people like that all the time. Um, and also, one thing to note is that the, the algorithms, Facebook algorithms and Instagram, these sorts of things, they, they're unconscious, okay? They, are, they now serve up ideas to you that can um, aggravate you and cause you to have a response. And the algorithms don't know what it's about, right? And uh, you're going to get more and more of that stuff in your feed. The longer it stays on your screen, the more you like it, the more it makes you unhappy, the more virulent things you type in there. That kind of stuff, it's reinforced because they want you to stay on the screen as long as possible. Because the longer you're on the screen, the more ads you get. And the more it takes you away from mindfulness, right? Mindfulness really has nothing to do with the screen. You know, mindfulness is a nice walk, walk through the park, looking at trees where there's no past or no beginning, um, or there's no past, there's no future. And th this is not natural human behavior, right? Because this is causing you anxiety. I was talking about this with one of my friends. I live in New Zealand, and, and he was having some anxiety issues, and he spends a lot of time on his screen. I said, look, dude, think about it. You know, Just uh, five or 10 generations ago, we would not be doing this. We'd be, we'd be walking you know, across New Zealand, uh, we'd be out fishing, you know, we'd be talking to each other, telling stories. Uh, we'd be carrying some rocks back or whatever. We'd be setting up a fire um, for the night. Uh, we would light the fire as it gets dark. We would cook. We'd all sit around the fire, look at the fire, and we would all tell stories. N no anxiety, right? This is a very natural way of being human. And I have this new theory, by the way, that because 99% of our generations, they would sit around a fire every night and tell stories, this is what the screen has actually replaced because it's bright, it's at nighttime, and it's telling stories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, speaking of influencers, uh, Yuval Noah Harari's concept of fiction, uh, how does that relate to ideas of followers, likes, comments? Right. What's the relationship there? So, he has three great books out uh, Sapiens, Homo Deus, and 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. And he has these great concepts. I read a lot of books about anthropology and history. It's one of my hobbies. And by the way, he attributes his insights to doing 30-day silent retreats, where he has such clarity of thought that he's able to have these ideas. And one of the central ideas in his books is that humans are the only animal on the planet that can cooperate with strangers because we all collectively believe in fictions. Like we all believe uh, in an hour, which doesn't exist. You can't see it. You can't touch it. But it makes it convenient to say, hey, Bradley, I'll meet you at Google at 1 PM. Uh, there's no such thing as a meter. Uh, there's no such thing as a dollar. But we all agree on the story of these ideas so that we can cooperate with strangers. That's why chimps can't cooperate with strangers and all this kind of stuff, right? So this makes us special. We believe in fiction. So there's many stories, good stories that we believe in. There's some bad stories we believe in. But there's mostly good stories that allow us to cooperate. Now, as much as the hour, the meter, the pound isn't real, Neither is the follower, the like, or the comment. However, we have developed a, a monetary system where you can, you can trade you know, dollars for other things that can be measured. Now, and all of these have a, a substance. We all agree on the measurement, how long a meter is. Like, okay, you're going you're gonna to build me a, a, a train that's you know, 10 meters long. We know what you're going to get. Um, but now, if you can't trust in the veracity of a follower, a like, or a comment, that whole system falls apart. And so systems that depend on that, um, they can end up like Venezuela, because it's almost like a counterfeit currency. And right now, people kind of believe in it. And people are, I think they spent like $2 billion last year on influencers on Instagram. It's supposed to go to $10 billion by 2020. And if all this money is going into a system that can't be trusted, then you know, what's going to happen? It's not good. I don't want to live in a future where you can't believe the numbers that you see. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And I, I think that you know, we can do better. Um, and I think that these organizations would want to do better because they want to have a strong internal economy that can be trusted from the outside. Um, Yuval has this other great um, podcast he did with Sam Harris. And um, he was talking about uh, trains. And he said, you know, there's a time 
before trains and a time after trains. Trains is a technology. He says, trains don't really care what they do, right? Uh, people have used trains to build uh, communist infrastructure so they can carry goods from one place to another across Russia. It's been used in World War II to take people to concentration camps. Trains have also been used in Japan to take salarymen from Tokyo to Osaka, right? Trains, they don't care. It's a technology. So it's unknown how p humans will use technology. And I'm, I'm drawing that analogy now to social networks. Like, they're out there. Maybe that we have no control how people are going to use them. That's a possible sad reality. I would like to think we do have some kind of control. But so far, it doesn't appear that we do. And just we're kind of just grasping to, to fix things when it's way too late. And that's, not, that's also not the social media world I want to live in. You know, I want to live in a, a positive, awesome place because it has the potential uh, to do incredible things for humanity. Well, I want to talk about that because I know you self-describe as an optimist. You've mm -hmm. been pretty harsh on, uh, or realistic on people's relationship to social media. What do you see as the positive side and the opportunity for social media to uh, enhance and enrich people's lives? I, you know, I'm a travel photographer. I've been to all seven continents. I travel all the time. And I know that travel has made me a more gentle person. I know it makes pretty much everybody a more gentle person. And the thing is that I have inserted myself into situations that were uncomfortable, that I didn't understand. Like, here's a little story. I was in university, and then my, my dad took me to France, you know, and I'd just kind of been in the bubble of the USA my whole life. And then we went to France, and it was like different. I was like, Dad, why do they do it like this? You know, why do they put mayonnaise on their fries? What's wrong with them? Just little little things like this, right? And he goes, he goes, son, it's not better or worse. It's just different. I was like, oh, okay. And so I, I continue with the, these thoughts as I travel around and see how different parts of the world do things in different ways. It's just different, and I'm not judgy anymore, and I'm very accepting. And I, you meet people on the individual level, you know, kids, grown ups, and people are generally really nice. You know, they they want good for their family, they want good for themselves, they want good for their friends and neighbors. This is a universal human truth. It's totally true. Um, there's a bigger specter of ideas out there. And these, I these ideas have made themselves more prominent on social media rather than just people you know, loving their friends and help wanting, wanting to, everything to go for the best for them. So if we can shift around what we're focused on, on uh, you know, loving our family, uh, helping our friends, helping our neighbors, this very natural human behavior, um, I think this is something the internet can do. It hasn't been doing that right now because that doesn't seem very profitable. But humans are capable of so much. Um, it's done fantastic things. They're great stories. You know, like I'm sure how, you know, how many tens of thousands of engineers that were in small little villages of India have now ended up here in Silicon Valley. It's because of the internet. Like this is the idea of spreading a good idea. Um, and there's so many options for that. Uh, it's almost, I'm not sure what the exact solution for it is, but I know if on the individual level, if each of us choose to stay in more uh, positive groups and uh, help uh, surround ourselves with positive, loving friends that are pushing us, help to expose people to new ideas. I think that's really what happened to me as I traveled, is I saw so many ideas, right? I saw so many things I didn't initially agree with, and I thought, oh, maybe that's not so bad. And this is a truth for all humans. The more ideas you're exposed to, the more conversations you have, the more it opens your mind and makes you a more gentle person, opens your heart, keeps you vulnerable, and keeps you in that, that good place for humanity. Tell us about potting. What is potting? <laughs> potting. <laughs> this is a somewhat uh, nefarious tactic I go through in the new book. Um, it's, it w okay, what potting is, it's mostly used on Instagram. It's against their terms and, terms and services, terms and conditions. And it's when a, a group of people get together in a kind of cabal. Okay, it might be 10 people, it might be 1,000 people. Okay, and let's say they're in, it happens in every industry, you know, from um, fashion to travel to cars to you name it. But let's say they're in a, they're in a, a fashion um, pod. There's a thousand of them. Well, what happens is, like, let's say one of them posts a picture of themselves with a Prada bag. 
Well, they post inside their pod, which is usually a, a chat group, like in a, a WhatsApp or a Facebook group or somewhere else. And what happens is uh, immediately everybody, in, the other 999 have to go in within the first five minutes and comment on it and like it. And I'll have to do at least three words, all this sort of stuff. And then the algorithm sees like, oh, this is a hot post about the product back. And then it's more likely to be seen in more people's feeds. So I find this unethical in many ways because A, all of those comments are coerced because if you don't do what this cabal says, the pod does, you're kicked out and suddenly you're not getting as much as many followers or as much attention. Uh, so it's disingenuous. Um, and the second thing is that if Prada had paid for that or something that they're seeing all these comments are like, oh wow, you know, this is a great influencer. And also, to me, the other fundamental thing is all the other people that are just putting a, a picture up and trying, they're at a tremendous disadvantage. Um, and so it, it make, I, I see so much desperation out there, like on Instagram. People have a new business, you know, maybe their new wedding photography business, or maybe they've opened up a new pastry shop, you know, in, in Baltimore. And they just are trying to get attraction and trying to get interest or whatever. But meanwhile, people that are gaming the system, when you start to have algorithms out there that decide what people see, um, peop normal humans will try to game the system. Um, there's going to be all kinds of bots in out there. They're about to. They're getting smarter and smarter. They'll always be able to outsmart that algorithm, and it leaves like normal, honest people that are making good content and want the best. They're at a tremendous disadvantage. Um, that's just one of many negative things I outline in the book that's going on that I think is rotten. Uh, in terms of like how these pods self-organize and discover, where, where does that happen? Like, is that uh, obviously they're in an arms race with a spam and abuse team over right. at the at the platform level? But how how do they find each other and how do they develop? Are they authentic yeah. people in this case, or are they bots in this case and, they're authentic? Yeah. Um, a lot of the bad activity on there is bots, but this is authentic behavior. Um, although for unethical reasons. Normally what they do is they just contact you as a DM and invite you. I've been invited to three or four. Mm -hmm. I've never said yes. I talked to my friend, uh, Gino Barassa. He was invited to one. He was excited because he was kind of thinking get some action. He did it for a while. Then he felt like it was rotten. Then he left. And there's this website called socialblade.com, which keeps track of um, follower growth over time and all other kinds of stats. Because that's the only way you can really see is over time. And he shows me the time when he dropped out of the pod. You see his follower count drop down, his engagement drop down, all that kind of stuff. You see, so you see a quick ramp up as he joined the pod and then drop down. And so uh, you just sit around and wait to get invited because it, it obviously makes, like let's say you're in a fashion pod, like we need to get that gal that has, that woman, that has 100,000 followers. If she joins us, it'll be great for the pods. They want high level people, they don't want people with less followers, but people with just a few followers, they really want to be in there, right? Because it's good, it's good for them. It's just a little bit of a, and really what this amounts to is people have to stay on their phone eight to 10 hours a day, which you know many already do. They're flipping through Instagram, typing for this ridiculous system that is coerced, inauthentic, and unethical. A question, and I, I... Don't presume you know the answer, but do you feel like the platforms, and let's speak at an industry level versus mm -hmm. one company, but the platforms are complicit and actually benefit from behaviors like this and in terms of being attractive to brands and things like that? Or are they truly in an arms race where they're doing the best they can to uh, stop and condemn these behaviors, but it's hopeless? I don't know if they're complicit or complacent. Mm. Um, it's unclear. They're not doing much to, uh, to curb it. Every now and then, every three months, they have a big announcement that we're going to curb this kind of behavior. Uh, but then, you know, I looked online three or six months later, it's, you know, now mushroomed into 10 times as much. Mm. Um, part of the problem is they do want big numbers. I think that looks good for Wall Street. Um, they want people to stay on the screen as long as they can because then they get to see more ads. Um, I don't know if these are... I don't know if you can put moral judgment into it, but I don't find these to be great because you're, you know, there's a billion humans out there that are using this stuff. And you can make a strong argument that people are wasting many, many hours a day, countless days per month, probably a few months a year, in doing things that you shouldn't be doing, right? There's so many more things you could be doing that are positive, you know, that are loving for your family and friends or for the planet. So in that sense, I do kind of find it unethical 
I pose a few possible solutions in the book. One, which I don't think they would ever do, is uh, adopt the Spotify Netflix model. It's proven people are pilling, willing to pay for content. Um, and uh, I think that would be great, because now people could get their feed in chronological order once again, not get any ads. Um, their profits might drop, but they'll still make billions of dollars. And they're, they'll be plenty profitable. You know, they're going to have to. That's such a big pivot for such a queen, these Queen Mary type organizations. They they may not do it. It's going to make the users angry when they find out they have to pay. But the users are already angry. You know, give them this option. Say here 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 you go. Um, I think that's a possible solution. We've explored something like that with YouTube Red. You know, that right. enables you to pay a small monthly fee and and you smart. don't get the pre roll ads and right. uh, millions of people have signed up for that. So right. yeah. Um, okay, I want to turn it over to uh, both in the room, we have runners with mics, as well as we'll flip to the dory uh, shortly. So Trey, we've done a couple of experiments with uh, applying machine learning to photos, trying to separate out the good ones from the bad ones. And one of the factors that always comes up as the strongest is people really like it when you turn the HDR up to 11. And so you were way out in front on that. Uh, but how do we know when we're doing what people like and when, you, when have you gone too far? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think one reason I was unpopular as a photographer is because I liked very vibrant, colorful photos that had high dynamic range in it. That spoke to my, my retinex and my brain. It just made a lot of sense to me. And you were not supposed to manipulate photos. That was a bad thing to do. Um, it's a good question. You know, I know one thing for sure is that the stats show that if you put up a picture, if, if you yourself are in the photo, it gets 30 to 40% more likes. And people are so addicted to this public scoreboard of how popular you are, or how important you are, or how meaningful you are as a human, is somehow based on your likes, that people are drawn like, I better put myself in the photo. There was a trend that started about five years ago where you know I mostly do landscape photography. A lot of people started to put themselves in the landscape you know, they would hold out their arms outstretched like I'm finding my true meaning in life and all this nonsense, right? Or there would be like a solitary shadow holding a flashlight, like considering life, the universe, and everything. And those always got a ton of votes. And I thought, well, maybe I should start putting myself in the photo. I was like, that's ridiculous, Trey. You know, you would just be following what other people do. And, um, but like even I had that temptation. Um, so sometimes I think the what looks popular may not always be the best or like truly innovative. Um, so if, if you look at your, um, if you look at stats across the internet, if you look at the overall bell curve of like 10 million photos, and you see which ones have the most likes with machine learning, it'd be like, oh, okay, they all seem to have a, a picture of a person's face in there. So then the algorithm might just go through like, like, hey, let us help you find your best photos. It'll go through a thousand photos you took over the week, and it will only serve up p pictures with your face in it. Right, which may not be the most interesting photos. They are to the generalized bell curve, but they may not be the most interesting because humans just naturally respond to other people's faces. Um, so you know, you've got a whole you know can of worms there trying to figure out what's because you you may not want to go to the middle of the bell curve because the middle of the bell curve is boring. None of us were born to be boring. None of us were born to take boring photos and share boring photos. So you kind of look at these trends on a meta level. And it, to me, I find photography is a, a great creative tool that we all have access to now that can help you find your true self, right? So you take photos of a lot of different things, and you kind of choose what you like, and you post-process in a certain way. And, and you, might be, you might be tended to copycat other people for a while, but then you, know, you can start to find your own, your own voice. I have a, uh, a follow-up question to that. In terms of finding your own voice, tools like Instagram filters, Vasco, have made it so easy with one click or a swipe to sort of post-process and treat your photos. And um, I think at first it was um, a big improvement over, you know, your crappy photos now looked stylized and maybe, you know, crappy on purpose. But it certainly overplayed um, and uh, sort of takes away some of that individual voice. I mean, the dawn of hashtag no filter, right, is right. sort of like this is authentic and not over-processed. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about um, sort of empowering 
everyone with the superpowers of what used to be the purview of Photoshop jockeys and people who could right. afford expensive post-processing is now sort of a swipe away. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, I think it's great if people want to use filters. We uh, will plug here for a product we made with Skylum. We made this thing called Aurora HDR. It's on Mac and Windows. And last year, we actually won Mac's app of the year. It has millions of downloads. And like me, as a photographer with a special technique, why would I want to share my special technique with millions of people? Because I know it's not a zero-sum game, right? It makes the whole pie bigger. And you can't teach you know, millions or billions of people meditation. You can, but it's hard. But you can teach them to be creative. And I think when you're in a creative space, that you're being very present. There's no past. There's no future. So I think if people are using filters and having fun, that's a good idea. Um, one thing that I would say, you know, future-proofing, is that um, this is not how you'll interact with the world in 10 years, I promise you, OK? Um, looking at a little square, this is not a way to look at a photo, OK? It's, it's not, it, it kind of makes sense for the brain, but it, it doesn't. Like if you've been to a museum recently and you've seen like a large format print, and you physically have to move your head around a landscape to see it, this is natural because humans standing in a landscape, you move your head around, you build a patchwork quilt of what it's like. Here, your eye is just looking at one little thing. And you can make almost anything look good on Instagram. Everyone's a great photographer on Instagram. But that may not translate into uh, the, next, the next layer, right? There's some AR, VR combo where we're looking around a, a landscape. Uh, there may be 3D that comes into it. So this whole world of little filters, I think it's good to experiment because now you realize, oh, I can be creative. Think about this as a stepping stone for what everything will become in the future. I don't know what it is, but it definitely won't be looking at a little square. Well, I want to push you to offer some ideas about what it might be uh, beyond the little square. You look at synthetic photography, <laughs> and even the Pixel camera now mm -hmm. is able to do incredible uh, night photography mm -hmm. using techniques that are AI-based. What do you think might be next? Is it uh, combining modalities? Like, do you want to bring in sound and uh, depth and uh, 3D modeling? Or is it uh, um, more in the, the frame buffer and sort of the processing of capture? What, what do you think are the big innovations in photography that you're attuned to or curious about in the next 10 years? Right. I love my Pixel phone, by the way. I'm not a paid. Uh, Google guy, but I love it independently. Um, well, people do like to be visually stimulated, and there seems to be no limit to that, right? The more visually stimulating it is, the better. You know, uh, 4K is is better than 1080p, and so it's all going in that direction. And you know, we do have this bifurcated rectangular viewing system, so that's why we tend to like rectangular things. And given given the preference, we would not like to have any borders around that, just like we don't have any borders in real life. The higher the fidelity and the more realistic, I think the more we'll, we'll like it. Um, there's going to be stepping stones, of course, until we get to something that feels as real as this. Um, but I think the realer we get to this, the, the more people will like it. Now, of course, this means some kind of VR topping or AR that goes black and gives you this. I don't believe in 360 because people are lazy and you'd like to sit down. right? You're not going to be turning around on your sofa to see what's going on behind you. Uh, but I, I believe in 180, I, two modalities. One, I think, will be maybe three. One will just be a photo, right? just a still photo. Okay? I'm like, wow, this is really cool. Like, it looks perfect. A second version of that is one that's, that's moving. Mm. I think in landscapes, but it could be you're just sitting there at, uh, in Shibuya, the crossing in, in Tokyo, and you're just sitting there just watching people go by. Right? And someone could even set up a, Google could set up a camera there. right? That's just 180, super high res, you know, 10K around you. And I would just probably sit there on my couch and just watch people cross the street like for hours, you know? Um, you can do the same thing with a, a field in New Zealand where the, the, the uh, flowers are flapping around. You see a bird every now and then. Just There's a mountain in the middle. Portal to another yeah, point. Yeah, because you're just the there. Yep. And I think, I think that can be quite relaxing. And because I know people like to travel, not everyone can afford it, but soon you can do it in absolute fidelity, almost as good without going through the trouble of going through airport security and TSA and all that jazz, you can have a, a meaningful experience. Okay, so mode one is a still picture. Uh, level two is having motion, like with no story. Level three is having motion with a story, like you're sitting in the middle of a, 
uh, play, right? You're watching the Book of Mormon, right? And you're, you're just sitting actually on the stage. You can look around and watch all these actors. Um, you, it's all, it all could be all new for storytelling, all new equipment, all new skills. Um, no, no one has created these tools really yet. Um, so, you know, chances are everybody in this room and my kids are going to be doing things that haven't even been created yet with tools that haven't been created yet. Just like when I went to school, there was no digital photography, there was no internet, now I'm doing it. So um, there's going to be like so much opportunity for creativity. And I know what people are like. People love consuming stuff too. Yeah. Um, I do think everyone can be creative, and I think this will give them an opportunity to play around with being creative. Just like right now they're doing things like that on their phone, they'll have some device that they can capture the world around them, right? And they can share it, and then people can see their world. Um, they can have all new levels of creativity. Mm. So uh, if you do have a question, it would be helpful to move to the aisles uh, while Trey's answering. Uh, in the back, please. Uh, I'm curious how you reconcile the uh, treatment of places of natural beauty that are maybe not well known. Uh, you're, you're trying to share and celebrate these locations, but then you're giving away the location and, and destroying it, like Sunset Magazine, the, the pristine beach or trail or campground. Right. You show up on the cover, Sunset, and you used to be that was that was the end of that place, and now Instagram is destroying locations when it attracts so many people, and yet you want to share, right? How, how do you cope with that um, philosophically? That's a good question. Um, there's been a lot of stories now about what you said, Instagram ruining places. Um, to me, again, that's an egotistic thing where people just go get copycat photos, so they get a, cop a photo of themselves in front of this famous street in London. And you just look up and down the street, and everyone's just taking Instagram photos of themselves so they get more likes and they can repeat what others. This is what I consider to be mass delusional behavior. We've never seen this in human history. And I think the root of this, by the way, is tied to our, um, uh, I'll think of the word in a minute, uh, our 150 people, I know one of you know, that we have in our village. Dunbar number, yep. yeah. the Dunbar number. Dunbar is 150 which comes from, for 99% of our ancestors, we lived in villages with about 150 people. You know, you knew your immediate family, your friends, the, the shaman, the warriors, that sort of stuff. So your brain got wired to keep track of 150 people. If you think about your real life now, you can really keep track of about 150 people, not thousands and thousands. And normally, for 99.9% .9 of our history, you've been around those 150 people, and you're checking in, and you kind of know people's relationship and that sort of stuff. But now we're separated. We only have like 10 people around us that we know. And we're kind of connected to the other people on the internet. But you're also connected to thousands and thousands and thousands of people, right? And so whereas before, you wanted to put on a good show to make sure you impressed people and your 150 people, right? To make sure they're happy with you, make sure you're being a responsible member of the tribe and that kind of stuff. And, that you're attractive or whatever, you know, that you're doing something needed. Now you're connected to thousands or even more, and people had this compunction to impress strangers. It's never happened before. So now, like, you define your self worth on what thousands of strangers think about you, who will never have any impact on your life or whatever, who you'll never be friends with. And if you don't impress total strangers, you find yourself unworthy. So that's why people are going out to do this kind of thing. I think the problem more is with the selfie kind of situation or people taking friends of their photo, photos of their friends in these places. It doesn't happen quite so much with landscape photography. Um, there is sort of this roadside bingo thing with landscape photography. So you, you go to Tunnel View in Yosemite, and you'll see like 50 people lined up to get the same photo. That's not as environmentally destructive as some of these other things. Um, I tend not to do that. I tend to go around the outside and try different things. Um, have you ever obfuscated, like, you're not going to reveal where this is? Like, have you, or do you feel like that's not necessary? No, I, I share where it is because people ask. It seems wrong to say, I'm not going to tell you. You know, that seems <laughs> that's selfish. mean. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Uh, yeah. Um, but also, at the same time, I go out there and profess, like, find, find your own places. Yeah. Right? It's not... It's not any great accomplishment to go copy a place that I took, right? At, for example, this is why I don't take underwater photography of like sharks and whale sharks and you know coral and all this stuff, because you know we know Eric Chang, he's so good at it. It would take me ten years to be able to get to where he is, 
right? I'm interested in it, but I just can't do that. So I kind of stick with what I know and I like finding new places. Um, I really like street photography uh, because that's always different. It's always mm. dynamic. You'll never see the same thing. Um, yeah, hope that helps. Question, um, acknowledging the sunset effect that was brought up earlier. So you're visiting Northern California. A couple of your quick favorite spots to go shoot that you maybe already have shot and anything on your bucket list, like around here. All right, Northern California. Um, down PCH Highway 1 is a really cute place called McWay Falls. It's a little uh, waterfall that you can't see from the road. And there's usually not many people there. I chose to reinvent the shot <laughs> by just going at midnight when it was under a full moon. Um, and I thought it was very uh, romantic. It looked like this, a Star Trek set, you know, the old school Star Trek where it doesn't quite look real. <laughs> um, Muir Woods is great. Again, I, I consider it almost like street photography because there's so many views and it's, it can be so unique. Although shooting in forest is very difficult to get the 3D-ness of it into a 2D photo. Oh man, there's so many great places all in Northern California. Um, street, I've been doing some street photography the last two days and two nights in, in San Francisco around Chinatown because you just see interesting people there. There's cool lights. It's different. Uh, in a way, it could be anywhere. I like having photos that are a bit timeless. They could be anywhere. Um, gosh, um, that's all I can think. Those are three off the top of my head. But if you go to my blog and click on California, you'll see a lot. In terms of street photography, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, if you're taking a, a photo of Shibuya Crossing, you don't go and tell everyone, I'm going to be taking a photo right. of you and get their affirmative consent and yeah. things like that. What are your feelings around consent and capturing photos of people uh, in that right. context? I'm definitely a bit of a, a renegade on this and no authority. But I do take a lot of street photos, and I, I never ask for permission. There's a caveat on that. Um, because I want them to be uh, natural. You know, as soon as people know the camera's on them, a lot of people get a little weird, even if they're trying to act casual. Like only a real model can really act casual. So you really lose the moment. You lose the, you lose the person or, or the people and the way they're interacting with this environment, which sh should, should be very natural. Now, if I get a good photo, which sometimes I do, and then they notice me, which sometimes they do, I say, hey, guys, I got a great photo. Do you want to see? And I show it to them. I said, do you want me to send it to you? 99% of the time, they say no problem. Same, same thing with Burning Man is, you know, people are dressed crazy there, you know, and there's some nudity and stuff like that. I go crazy taking photos. I don't take nudes because that just seems a little gratuitous. You know, I try to be inventive and not show those, show those parts. And um, I do it without permission because people are in their natural state. You know, they're really feeling their own sense of self-expression, whatever happens to be going on. And um, almost always, I go over and show them the photo, and then I, you know, I, I send it to them. Um, I've only gotten like one out of a thousand rejections. Someone came up to me and told me to erase the photo, and it's because uh, she was a school teacher and she didn't want the other parents to find out. Um, I say no, no problem. She wasn't saying it in a mean way. She was like, "Totally cool. I know what you're doing, but yep. I don't want to get in trouble." I'm like, "No problems." So yeah, it's really fine. It's especially I find that the U.S. is a very fear-based, mm -hmm. right? If there's a kid in the photo. They just assume you're some kind of child predator because the news media has scared moms so much, and it's, I don't think that's healthy. When I, I think a lot of photographers, we just think kids are cute, you know. So I've now I tend to take photos more in Asia, in Japan, where they don't they don't they don't think it's weird. Um, you don't you don't get people's heckled. People are just like ready to be offended by stuff mm -hmm. here. You know, they think it's it's poisonous how much fear there is. And not just in the U.S., but other places. They just think, like, their heckles are always up instead of... It's the total opposite of Burning Man, right, where you're walking around, you know, everyone's just there full of love. No one's going to come after you. Um, that's why I wish the world was, was more full of love, and I think it's up to people like us to, to make that happen. Sorry. Uh, question about post-processing. So, uh, you know, oftentimes, uh, due to post-processing, photographs are warped from reality. Uh, sometimes I wonder, you know, what was the reality and what is the actual outcome? Is there some standard that photographers generally should prescribe to to uh, indicate how much processing has been done and how much further away a photo has moved from the reality? Well, there's no standard for any creative art. Um, absolutely, that's sort of a, you know, a basic statement. 
I'll tell you what I, I tend to do. This is my, my thought process. Um, I think a lot about uh, kids, you know, and how they're able to very quickly go between what's real and what's not real, effortlessly. They have a very thin membrane, right? They'd be talking about dragons and all kinds of stuff, and then suddenly you're talking about having some pudding, you know, and they just go back and forth, you know, and it's not clear that they're sure of the difference, you know. But as humans, we don't have this thin membrane, or as grown-ups, we don't have this thin membrane, and it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And they're like, this is real, and this is what's not real. And you still enjoy the fantasy not real, but you have to go into a dark theater for two hours, turn off the lights so no one can see you, so you can be alone, and experience this fantasy reality, which you completely give up. You know, you say like, oh man, this is a great story, and you really get into it. It doesn't matter that it's not real. And this is part of my overall thesis, is it, there's not a big difference between what's real and what's not real, as long as it's beautiful and full of truth. So for my photos, I usually like to walk that line. Like, is it real? Is it not real? And this causes uh, a conflict in the brain um, as you wonder, is it real or not real? And I, I think this, this tension between what's real and what's not real is, is interesting. Counterintuitively, with art, especially photography, is you want to um, confuse or abstract the information so that their brain has to look at it for a while to figure out what's going on. I notice when I look at Instagram or Facebook, I stop on the photos that don't quite make sense. I'm like, what's, what's going on? Is this a shadow? Is it a dress? You know, where's the light coming from? Um, so those ones that are mysterious, I stay on. Uh, phones today are so good, you know? You take a pic picture and everything is totally literal, right? There's no guesswork. It's almost like a courtroom drawing. You see everything that's there and the mind has nothing to wonder about. So I do what Pierre Auguste, Auguste Renoir did. He would always purposely obscure information or confuse information or have parts of his painting that didn't make sense. Because as you're trying to work it out, your, your brain doesn't really like a mystery. It will start to fill that mystery with your own history, um, everything that you feel, everything that you think, your own stories. So you're going to start to build a story about what this is about. And as you're doing that, you become really intertwined with the art piece. I uh, recently bumped into a listicle, which was you know top 20 optical illusions. And if you ever need a reminder that uh, reality is a construct anyways, mm. so much of these were just absolutely stunning in terms of how much my brain filled in or hallucinated uh, given the right you know, raw material. Right. So um, it's fascinating that you deliberately play with real and non-real because it's happening all the time whether we're aware of it or not. What's your advice for um, you know, discovering new content beyond the, the, the mainstream that everybody thinks about? Like, How do you find the, the next cool thing to pay attention to? Right, I would try to follow uh, curators that are out there. Like, not, not everybody is a pure creator. Some people are curators. And they are following uh, new people all the time, recommending new talent. Um, there's lots of great websites for that. Um, and also, if you just follow some artist that you respect and admire, they will often mention other people. Like, like oh, he thinks these people are interesting. I'm going to go follow them. Um, that's probably my, my best advice. Follow curators and trust what your current network is. Always be up. I always say, always be upgrading your, your Dunbar 150, mm -hmm. right? You really only have to follow 150 really interesting people. That's what your brain is, is used for. Same way with friends. Try to keep upgrading your friends. Not to say your old friends are bad, but like you, you deserve great friends. You deserve great art. You deserve to be inspired. You, know, you deserve all these things as a human. Um, I remember the name of that book. That I, it's my number one book recommendation. It's called The Untethered Soul mm. by Michael Singer. Thank you Has, for that. Sure. And thank you. I want to, on behalf of all of us here at Google, uh, thank you for the work that you do, both the art you create and taking the time to explain the process and invite us into your own journey. It's incredibly generous and incredibly helpful. Thank you, Trey. Thank you.